All right, you can take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 5 as we begin a new series today on the journey of spiritual maturity. So I'm going to continue as I usually do and preach expository messages, but we're going to do it by jumping around Scripture over the course of the, I don't know, whenever. You know, I never know when these series end. Uh, The time usually changes, as Emily can attest, as I have a nice spreadsheet of my sermons for the year, and I think I'm on version, Pastor Perry says 17. I believe it's five, but uh, not all of that is my doing. All right. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 5, maybe a well-known passage to you, maybe not, Um, and there's a lot to this, and I'm a little fearful that it could take a while, because my first point is going to take longer than the other two, uh, but it's important. If we don't get the first point right, then we're we're going to miss the point of the other two, and so I want you to just walk patiently through the first part with me, and then I'll try to speed along as we get going, but... Hebrews has five passages. They're often called the five warning passages. And the author of Hebrews, it's like he pauses his, his letter to the, the Hebrews, and he pauses it to kind of, uh, he's been t- talking, it's a doctrinal book, but then he pauses it five times, kind of trying to emphasize the correct application of the doctrine that he's been going through. And it's because there's this battle going on in the first century church and Hebrew believers are being tempted to turn back to the Jewish faith. And so he pauses these five times to say, here's the doctrine I just taught. You should know these things. And these things should cause a change in you, an impetus that pushes you forward. So make sure you apply it correctly. And he does that five times. This is the third one. We're looking at the third pause of the, fir- the third warning passage. And he, he's becoming increasingly more pointed as he addresses them. Really, as I said, the book is saturated with doctrine, and it's meant to, to fortify their faith. And uh, in, in a sense, it hasn't been working. Now, he, he's writing this book. They're receiving it at once. So he's giving them this warning passage, these warning passages in the book, So they read through it over and over again, and they get drawn into the correct faith. And so as we begin um, this journey of spiritual maturity, we're going to start with the marks of spiritual immaturity and maturity. We'll look first at the marks of spiritual immaturity, starting in chapter 5, verse 11. It's going to appear, because I am starting in the middle of a sentence here in verse 11, and we're going to continue through chapters into chapter 6 because I think this is an unfortunate chapter break. Um, so just read with me and we'll start in verse 11 and, and gather some context as we go along here. So chapter Hebrews 5, verse 11, Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, And you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Continue on. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to the perfection, not laying again the foundation of the repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. And this we, this we will do if God permits. Let's pause there and, and dive into this section in chapter 5. He begins, I, I started it, and I, I fully admit I started it in the middle of a sentence, uh, because that's where the verse break is. But I want you to see the marks of spiritual immaturity from this passage. And we'll go back and get a little bit of context here in a minute. 
But I want you to see what he says starting in chapter 5, verse 11. He makes a statement at the end of whom we have much to say. He's speaking of Melchizedek, the doctrine of the high priest. We'll get, we'll get back to that. He has much to say and hard to explain to them since they have become dull of hearing. The first mark of somebody who's spiritually immature is they've become dull of hearing. And the, the, the words aren't, that's not hard to understand. But what they're listening to for them is hard to understand. They can't explain it. It's difficult. Oh, it takes hard work. Like when you ask your child to take the trash out. Oh, all of a sudden, we talked about this a while ago, their legs go limp. They lose power in their arms. It's difficult. And that's how it is here for these listeners. They're listening, and all of a sudden he gets the author of the book of Hebrews and starts talking about the, the order of Melchizedek and the office of the high priest, and they're like, ugh. They're getting weak. They can't listen. This is, this is over their head. It's hard for them to understand, and they don't want to do the work to understand it. They're dull of hearing. They need to listen. They need to know more about the power of Christ. But they have ear trouble. Now listen, 50 years ago, J. Vernon McGee said, ear trouble is the biggest problem of believers today. Now if, if J. Vernon McGee said that 50 years ago, how much more is it a problem now? If that's true, and I do think it's true. So here, these, they're dull of hearing. It, let me put it in a little bit more common language. They are not comprehending the speaker. Right? Whoever the author is, or the, or the authors, the people who've been teaching doctrine, writing these New Testament books, uh, teaching the people about their faith in Christ, they become bored. They're bored with the teacher. It's as if the teacher is speaking in another language. Right? This is like the teacher of peanuts, which I don't like peanuts. I never liked it. But, but, but wah, wah, wah. we all know that. Anyone who's over the age of 20 knows that at least. Right? Wah, 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 wah. That's what they hear. These New Testament brand new believers, they're just bored with the teaching. It's wah, wah, wah. You know, the, drone, the teacher is just droning on. And they're not interested in what they have to say or, or what they're supposed to be listening to. So this isn't a speaker issue. This is a listener issue that the, the author of Hebrews is addressing. And this leads some people to find new teachers. Right? If this teacher here of the author of Hebrews or the authors of the other books of the New Testament are boring, then they just start looking for new teachers. Teachers who might, as uh, 2 Timothy says, tickle their ears. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. So they're going to look for people who will tell them the things they want to hear, rather than sit under teaching that is sound, that is true and reasonable. And so the danger of this is becoming a bad listener, and that increases their habit of being a bad listener, which leads to greater spiritual immaturity and by the way increased sin and so bad listeners are dangerous because they often misinterpret scripture and they lead other people astray they give poor advice they, they struggle to discern what is good and what is not they remain spiritually stunted and they're lazy and so the first attribute or the first quality if i could call it that or or poor uh trait is that they are they are dull of hearing the second aspect or characteristic of a spiritually immature believer is they are unable to share the truth. Look at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. So these, these people have been saved long enough that they should be instructing others. And when we hear the word teacher instruct, we think of a classroom. But, but I don't want you to think of it on such a, a micro scale. Think of it bigger. Discipleship. This is someone who's taking another believer and helping them become more like Christ. If you've been saved for more than, more than five years, I, I would, if I had to put a number on it, you should be easily discipling other Christians. 
And yet what we have are, are many timid and fearful Christians who don't want to invest in other people's lives because they're afraid that they might not know what to say or, or they don't know what to say, and so they just sit back and they don't invest in anyone. They ought to be teachers. This probably scares some of uh, the, the listeners, the readers of Hebrews. And it might scare some of our Christians today because we think we've relegated the, the idea of teaching, discipling to the pastor and the Sunday school teachers. And that's wrong. It, it must happen there, but it must happen on many other different levels and facets of a ministry. Every one of you, if you've been saved and called by God, should be discipling someone else. And I don't care if you got saved last week. You should be investing in other people for the cause of Christ. But a lot of people don't. They're unable to share knowledge of the Bible because their knowledge is too basic. They have not redeemed the time, as Ephesians 5 says. And so let's consider. Let's do the same thing and consider for ourselves. How long have you been a Christian? How long have you been saved? I've been saved now, if I do the math quickly in my head, 37 years. That's a long time. Some of you have been saved longer. What have you done in that time period, uh, the decade or two decades that you've been a believer in Christ, who have you been investing in? What could you successfully teach about the power and the work of Jesus Christ? And yet here, they're, they're still needing someone to teach them. In fact, they still need the first principles of Christ, the first oracles of God. They don't even understand those. And so he says in verse 12, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk. Now this is interesting, the language here. You have come to need or returned to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. They are a baby. And so here, these people, they should be teaching, they should be discipling, they should be investing in other people, and yet they still need someone investing in them. And I, and I don't mean on a, on a nice, even discipleship level, but they are stunted in their growth. They're like a baby, he's saying. They have to be retaught again the basic things of Scripture, these first principles. That it, it literally, in, in Greek, means the elementary things. We would say the ABCs. they got to go back to kindergarten because they don't know the basic truth. Now listen, the context of this passage is to Hebrews. That's why it's titled Hebrews. Right? These are Jewish people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So we're not talking about the New Testament even. We're talking just about the Old Testament. They don't understand how the Old Testament fits with Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's what they're struggling with. Now we know from, from the context of the book of Acts and the book of Galatians that there are believers, or, or there are Jews, rather, there are Judaizers, Jews who are following Paul. We know at least Paul, but others as well. And, and Paul would venture into a new city and he would preach the gospel and Jews there would be saved and, and they would start to follow Christ and then he would leave and go to the next city and the Judaizers would come in and they would find those brand new baby Christian Jews and they would say, I know Paul said Jesus is the Christ and that's okay, but you need to add the law back in. You have to be circumcised. You have to go through the rituals and the rites of the, of the, of the temple. You need to put Judaism in with Christ. And what they did is they took the work of Christ and they added the work of man to it. That's false. And so these Hebrew believers, their whole life have grown up in the tradition, many of them, of the Jewish faith. And that sounds pretty good and comfortable. And so they're returning to some of the Jewish practices when they don't need to. Christ is sufficient. But they're babies. And they're not sure how to defend that. And so the author of Hebrews is telling them that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. And so they need to be retaught the truth of Christ. 
They need to be taught what, what the purpose of the law of the Old Testament is. How the things of the Old Testament foreshadow Jesus Christ. They need to understand the sacrifices and the ceremonies and the pictures of Christ like Melchizedek from chapter 5. So go back to chapter 5, verse 10. You see, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He's speaking of Christ. In fact, the whole purpose of chapter 5, Jesus Christ is better than any high priest that Israel ever had. For He walked in and He offered once for all a sacrifice that no high priest could ever offer. He's a picture of the perfect uh, high priest that Melchizedek was picturing, who was king and high priest. But there's a difference. Jesus Christ is prophet, priest, and king. He's superior to Melchizedek. And they needed to understand who Melchizedek was and what Melchizedek's purpose was. He was a picture of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice that Christ would give as high priest, but also as the sacrifice. And those believers didn't understand that. Now listen, maybe as you're sitting here today, you're going, Boom, I didn't understand who Melchizedek was. Well then learn. Grow. That's the point. We don't have to know everything about every passage of the Bible. But we're either growing with Christ or we're returning to milk over and over again. That's his point. To continue to grow to move beyond the basics of Scripture and be able to share those, to teach those to other, to others. That's what walking by faith involves. And yet, these people, the third mark is they have a baby food diet. They're a bunch of adult babies drinking milk, never eating meat. Milk is easy to be digested here. It's obviously representative of the, the basic things of Scripture. And so their accusation is they've reverted to this baby food diet when they should be consuming meat. Milk is pre-digested. It's specifically suited for, for babies. And yet meat, meat is valuable, has deep nutritional value, but it takes a long time to digest. It takes the advancement of the body. It takes, in this case, he's going to use the word skill. And yet these believers, these immature Christians, they're like babies, just drinking milk. They're ignorant and they're immature. Have you ever seen a baby who was only fed milk long beyond when uh, it should have been receiving meat? Right? You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember. We're too far removed now. This is unfortunate. Uh, from having little children, but I think we started feeding them solid foods before they were one, you know, basic things. And by the time they're, they're one, they're eating things, you know, like your pizza crust that you don't want, things like that, you know, other things. But by the time they're two, they're, they're starting to consume real adult food. Uh, I, we, had a, a, we have a friend, we still have that friend, whose granddaughter w was over two and still only drank milk. And this baby was the fattest baby you would ever see. But she had a problem. She couldn't sit up, she couldn't roll over, and she couldn't crawl. At two. She looked plump. She was plump. <laughs> she had rolls on her rolls. Right? But she was malnourished. She was unhealthy. And she couldn't perform the, the basic functions of a two-year-old. Who should be getting in trouble? Maybe that's why they did it. I don't know. She was paralyzed by her immaturity and her diet. And, and I'm afraid that there's Christians that are like that too. They're only having milk. And although they might even have the appearance of being plump as Christians, they're immobile. They're ineffective. They can't do anything because they've been feasting on the wrong things. This is characteristic of how the Jews under Judaism were. At the time of Christ, Jesus Christ comes. He reveals that He's the Messiah, and yet they don't, they're not expecting Jesus to be the Christ. They're expecting an earthly king who would sit on a throne. They had all these expectations of who Jesus should be, but their expectations were wrong. They were malnourished. And they couldn't even understand how Jesus could lay down His life on the cross and rise from the dead. They didn't understand those things. So they rejected Jesus because they were spiritually 
immature. Oh, they were faithful in the work of Judaism. They were faithful in the temple, faithful in the sacrifices. They had, they had all kinds of laws of what to do and how to do it, but the practical application of knowing Christ, they couldn't do it. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is warning them against because they are unskilled in righteousness. They cannot properly apply themselves to righteous living. They walk by sight, not by faith. So they must be told what to do and how to do it. They can't take the Word of God and discern for their own life how they should live. And by the way, this happens. This happens in our society. When I, I cringe whenever I hear, but my pastor said, and it's erroneous. Because what I, what I find over the years are many Christians who say, my pastor said, this is what I should do. Or that is what I should do. Can I, can I tell you who the first, the primary person should be in helping you discern right and wrong? It should be the Holy Spirit. And it should be His use of the Word of God in your life. So if you, put, don't ever say, if I hear you say this, oh, you're in trouble. Don't you ever say, Pastor Minton said, I want you to take what I say and go to God's Word and say, oh, Pastor said it, and there it is. Or, Pastor said it. It's not there. You answer for you. Don't pin it off on me. Don't say, well, my pastor said, I hate that phrase. You better point to Scripture, and you better know Scripture well enough that you can do that. Because you get to heaven, and you say to God, well, my pastor said, and you're the, you're the one in trouble, not me. So we had better be wise about our use of God's Word. Skilled. Move beyond the basic things that, we, that, we, that are easy. Easy to digest. And we just go over and over and over and over again the same basic things of Scripture. Can I tell you, there's a problem with this, there's a problem with this in conservative Christianity. There are, I, I'm going to give you my opinion. This is my opinion right now, okay? So don't, no, don't take it too far. But uh, there are some well-known Baptist writers and I don't want to read their books. Because their books are the same. Every single one. Go to church, read your Bible, pray. Now listen, those are all three good things that you should be doing. But they're milk. I'm tired of reading conservative Christian books because they're just basic milk over and over and over again. And there they are. They're spoon-feeding Christians because Christians can't go deep enough in Scripture to study and get meat. That's a shame for conservative Christianity. And I'm telling you, this is one of the major problems. Conservative Christians are not writing good books. Heaven, for decades. Only the basics, over and over and over again. It's a real problem. And so, what you believe in standard, in conduct, it must come from God's Word. You should be able to say, thus saith the Lord, or Here's why I do what I do. Because Christ says this. We should all be able to do that. Doesn't mean we can do it every time. Doesn't mean if I ask you for a, a hard doctrinal stance that in that moment you can cite me the, the verse, the reference perfectly and tell me the verse in, 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 in frontwards and backwards. I'm not saying that. Listen, I have problems sometimes finding the address of these verses. You know, that's why when I'm preaching, I'm like, James says, it's because I can't remember the reference. All right, It happens, but you better know God's Word. Hide it in your heart to give an answer for the things that you believe. And here's the problem. It leads to the fourth issue. They're unskilled in discernment. Because they're on a baby food diet, because they're babies, they're not skilled. Verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, you give a brand new a baby who's on milk, you don't give them, the first time they take solid food, you don't give them a piece of steak to gnaw on, right? They can't, they can't chew it, they can't digest it, they can suck on it maybe, but that's about it. You give them food that's been ground up, you, know, you take the peas and you grind them up and you watch them make the goofy faces as they eat the food. 
right? And slowly they build and they start to eat your pizza crust and other things, highly nutritious things, right? They exercise. They discern. Christians need to do the same thing. They need to exercise their faith. First, it starts out small, easy, and it builds. And they understand the basic doctrines of Scripture, but then they have to be moving forward. If they're not moving forward, then he, as he's going to point out, we're moving backwards. Solid food is, is this strong meat here. It contrasts the milk. It's looking beyond the surface level of Scripture and feasting on God's Word. And yet the unskilled here cannot exercise mental and spiritual senses. And this takes training, the training of spiritual discernment. And so the Judaizers, they're being easily manipulated to return back to the Old Testament interpretations. And I'm not saying good Old Testament interpretations. I'm saying the bad Old Testament interpretations. They're sitting here thinking they have to add the law back into their life and obey the law because if they don't obey the law, then, then their works are not good enough for God and they're not going to be saved. So this is work salvation. Right? The Judaizers say, you want to believe in Jesus? Good, believe in Jesus. But you have to do these other things that God has told us and if you do those things, you get to go to heaven. If you don't do those things, you don't get to go to heaven. It's work salvation. And we're going to drive to the point. He's dri the author is driving to a very clear point here. But the unskilled, the baby, they go, oh, okay. Listen, babies don't care who feeds them. Right? You got a bottle, for the most part. You got a bottle of milk, baby will eat it, for the most part. And it's the same idea here. The listeners, the Hebrew listeners, this person is smarter than me, I guess, so I'm going to listen to him. There's no discernment. There's no practical application to take and to say, is what was just said lining up with Scripture? They're unskilled. They can't do it. They can't refute. They're not spiritually strong enough to stand correctly on spiritual truth. And by the way, our society, too, has the same style of temptation of adding works back into salvation. There are plenty of churches uh, that are teaching, plenty of pastors that are teaching the necessity of church attendance. Now listen, you should be in church, but not, not so that you can get into heaven, but because you love your Lord so much that you're going to carve out whole segments of your week to give Him the glory that He deserves. That should be your mindset. And listen, I understand maybe you're here today because I, I, I made you feel guilty. I wasn't trying to. That's the Holy Spirit, by the way. But if you're here, good. Glad you're here. Maybe you came here because you didn't have anything else to do. Maybe you're here for the wrong reasons. We used to get people coming. In Africa, they come to the church because they wanted to ride in our truck. I don't care. You might have a horrible motivation for going to church, but if I can get you there, I'll get you there. God uses the time to change their hearts. But listen, if you're spiritually mature, you don't need motivation. You don't need anyone to twist your arm, to call you and remind you, to ask you where you've been. You shouldn't need any of those things. You should say, giving my Lord worship is the highest priority of my week. There is nowhere else I want to be than with, with other believers giving God praise. That's spiritual maturity. And yet here they, they lack discernment. And today, even some people elevating baptism up with salvation or Bible reading or church attendance or serving or worship styles, you have to get those things right. If you don't get those things right, then you can't be saved. And that's false. All those things, by the way, they're good, right? I'm not... Church attendance, obviously good. Reading your Bible, obviously good. But those are the basic things. Let's add. And yet here they lack discernment. They struggle to correctly categorize good and evil. That's discernment. They, they struggle in a situation to ethically understand and know what Christ wants them to do. They're blurred in their vision, unsure what the Scriptures say. They lack discernment. So how do you evidence a diet of spiritual maturity? 
I just, I'll, I'll give you a little quiz. Let me make up a little quiz for you. What would you give to basic questions like, where does the Old Testament proclaim Jesus Christ as the Messiah? Let's say your neighbor comes to you and says, I, I don't understand like, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right? The Old Testament's like about God, the God of Israel, God the Father, he's judgmental, he's harsh, he's angry. And the New Testament's about Jesus. He's loving and he's kind and he's accepting, right? What would you tell them? By the way, wrong. What would you tell them? Where could you go in the Old Testament to point that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. You should be able to do that. You should be able to go to the Old Testament and highlight the fact that God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament and He's loving and He's gracious and He's kind. And you should easily be able to point to the New Testament and say, by the way, the one who's judging in the New Testament is Jesus Christ. He has a sword coming out of his mouth and he is going to slay the, the wicked and send them to hell. Can you, can you point to scripture that talk about heaven and hell? Can you explain those things? Can you explain the Old Testament sacrificial system? What was its point? Can you explain or highlight how Jesus Christ appears all through the Old Testament and, and there's all these beautiful pictures, Jewish pictures, highlighting Jesus Christ, the Messiah? You should be able to, those are basic things. In fact, he's even getting to that uh, in chapter 6. He's going to call them the elementary principles of Christ. And so let's read the marks of spiritual maturity now. Verse 14, he, we just read, he's the uh, exercise, the ability to exercise or to discern both good and evil. Then verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Therefore, Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to the perfection, not laying again, or not returning again to the milk, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment, and this, will, uh, this we will do if God permits. Listen, when did you get saved? How long ago did you repent, accepting Christ, receiving Christ? I have no doubt that you had, after you did that, you had an initial burst of spiritual growth. It's natural. What happened after that burst of spiritual growth ended? Right? I mean, just think of it. You're going you're gonna to immediately grow as a Christian. All these things you didn't know before. You give new eyes, new sight and you grow and you learn. Maybe you do it for a year, two years, three years. And then what? I'll tell you what happens. A lot of Christians plateau. And I'm afraid that many, many times that plateau lasts five years, ten years, fifteen years. And when I talk to Christians who've been saved for a decade or two, they're just looking back. Tell me, how you're growing in Christ, and they look back to 20 years ago. You should be able to look back to 20 days ago, 20 weeks ago, and say, here's how God is changing me recently. Here's what I've learned about God, who is transcendent above anything that we can ever fully comprehend. There's always more to learn about God. And we should be able to look back just a short period of time and say, I can tell you, I've grown from, from April 1st of 2024 to now. And so one of the marks of, of spiritual maturity is a call, re, listening, abiding by this call of spiritual progress. And he began in, in chapter 5, verse 14, and he continues on. That's why the... Verse 1, he says, therefore, and that, that's why we know chapter 5 and chapter 6 are connected, because he says, therefore. Because of the things we just learned in chapter 5, because of the marks of, Im of spiritual immaturity, therefore, be mature. That's what he's saying in, verse, in chapter 6. 
leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ and go on to perfection. So solid food belongs to them that are of a full age, he says in verse 14. Their senses are exercised so that they can discern, they grow for the purpose of using wisdom, but then they move on to perfection in in chapter 6, verse 1. Full maturity. They move on to full maturity or the state of being complete. They move past the first principles of Christ. And he lists them for us. Now, this isn't a complete list, but it's a pretty good list to get started. What are the basics? What are the ABCs? The author of Hebrews says the ABCs of your faith are. Well, they're the basic truths of the Messiah. Notice he says the the elementary principles of Christ. He doesn't say of Jesus. He says of Christ. Christ means anointed one or the Hebrew word Messiah. He's talking about the doctrines of the Messiah. Je- a lot of Christians say Jesus is a good teacher. He's loving. He's kind. That's who Jesus was. Let's talk about who the Christ is. He's the Redeemer. He's the perfect sacrifice. He is the one who existed before the foundation of the world, who loved you so much that He came to earth to walk and be persecuted by sinful men so that He could pay and atone for your sins. That's the Messiah. Those are the basic truths. The birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. We should know those things. That's not meat. That's the milk. He goes on, uh, uh, the knowledge of God's Word. This is repentance from works. To turn from our own ability and our own worth, our works cannot save us, which is the thing that the Judaizers are struggling with. Or faith, that's trust in Christ alone. Or baptism. Baptism doesn't save anyone from their sins. It proclaims that they have already been forgiven and they want everyone to know it. Or the laying on of hands the apostles did not have special power that they could transfer God's authority from one person to another. Who transfers God's authority? God does. God is the one who gives good gifts. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not the apostles. By the way, Elemis the sorcerer in Acts tried it. He offers Paul money. I'll pay you if you put your hands on me and give me this power from God. Yeah, Paul didn't want... Mm. <laughs> Paul called him Satan. By the way, Catholic Church could take note of this. Right? There's no apostolic succession. Power comes from Jesus Christ. Uh, the resurrection of the dead. This is the bodily and spiritual resurrection of those who put their faith in Messiah. And that's knowing that from the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Eternal judgment. That's casting unbelievers into eternal damnation. And so it's time for Christians to move beyond kindergarten. That's what he's saying. They must be determined to grow in Christ as well. He says in verse 3, this we will do if Christ permits. The believer must be determined to stick to the meat diet. doesn't mean they never have milk to wash the meat down, but there's real sustenance. It acknowledges the will and the necessity of God to enact change in someone. And so those are the marks of spiritual maturity. And then because the author of Hebrews here is talking to a bunch of brand new Jewish believers who are being tempted to go back to Judaism or to incorporate Judaism into their faith, he he brings up the topic of spiritual maturity and salvation. And this is the warning passage. This This is actually the hardest one. The one that confuses people, that alarms them because it surrounds salvation. And so people wonder, can I lose my salvation? That's a milk issue. And and the author is going to address it. And so he gives us spiritual maturity and and understanding our salvation. And he starts in verse 4. We're going to go through this really quick and we'll be done. 
For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. All right, this is the warning passage. And and it's, it's easily confused if we don't exercise spiritual discernment. And when I say that, I mean we have to understand what Scripture teaches. Listen, if, if you can build an entire doctrine off of one passage or one verse or one word, then either it's a false doctrine or it's not that important for you to understand or know. There's a lot of people that read this passage and they say, oh, look at it, it says... For if it is possible for those who are once enlightened, and then skip down to verse 6, to fall away. (gasps) This is a passage that teaches you can lose your salvation. That's not what this passage is at all. And when we exercise spiritual discernment, we know that. So what is it? He's trying to show us that a lack of maturity does not mean a lack of salvation but a lack of growth. And there's plenty of other passages. It's impossible, he starts, it's impossible for those who were once, and then he gives all these descriptions of somebody who's saved. They're enlightened in in verse 4. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They become partakers of the Holy Spirit. These people are joined with God. They're saved. Only, Only believers can be partakers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not indwell unbelievers. He'll have no part with unbelievers. That's why He condemns them, casts them to hell forever. So these are believers. And it's saying it's impossible for these believers, these people who have salvation, to fall away, to lose their salvation. How do we know this? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, he starts the book by saying, who being the brightness, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the power of His Word when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. So who purged your sins? You? No. Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ does not need your help to provide salvation. And that is that is the most basic truth of salvation. You're a sinner. Only Jesus can save you. That is, that's the A of the ABCs. And if we know that to be true, then that should dictate the whole rest of the passage. And so he said that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the very beginning of the book. I'm writing to you a bunch of Hebrews that Jesus is the Christ and you must remember... And then he says that wonderful statement that he, him, he had by himself purged our sins. Didn't need your help. It's not your work. You can't contribute to your salvation. You can't add to it. You can't help Jesus Christ out. It's not like Jesus got you 99% of the way there and you've got to do the last 1% to kind of get it above. No. Christ did everything. Period. And so you can't do anything to gain salvation. He says that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He tasted death for you, in your place. Continue on. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, the work of salvation was complete by Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. Now this, this, one, this one has some meat in it. Because it's telling us that Jesus Christ is... God, and He's eternal, and He's not bound by time. We're bound by time. You're like, yes, Pastor, we wish you would be more bound by time. It's 11.05. Hurry up. Here's the point. 
I got saved in the spring of 1986. Well, what does this verse say? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ finished salvation before he ever even created the, earth, the world. Now, okay, that's me. That's hard to comprehend. But in light of that, let's not return to milk and think, do I have to help Jesus? Does He need me? If I skip church, does that mean I lose my salvation? If I, if I don't read my Bible, does that prove that I'm not a believer? No, it proves you're immature. It proves you're a baby. That's all it proves. It proves you don't love Christ like you should. And so this is all a hypothetical situation. And here's the, he, he drives to that point in verse, uh, verse 6. If they fall away, it's impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. So what, what happens? Let's follow that, that, that poor theology down the road just a little ways if you're a believer and you sin and you lose your salvation what are you going to do crucify jesus again by very logic if you fell away that you're saying his sacrifice wasn't enough so what are you going to do crucify him again if he died a second time would that save you then here's the point they're thinking all wrong about salvation it's not about what you add to God. You can add nothing to Jesus Christ. It's all His work. And that's a basic truth. And it's a basic truth of salvation. There's a lot of great passages. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-12. through 12, A great passage on the assurance of salvation. Now add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance godliness, and patience. And, and, and it goes on. If these things be in you and abound... They make you that you will neither be barren nor unfruitful. In other words, he's saying if you grow, then you're not going to doubt. If you grow, then you're going to have all these things, these great qualities of Christ in you, and you're not going to be barren or unfruitful. You will be fruitful for Christ. It's about growth, not loss of salvation. Same thing here. He's telling us grow. Grow in Christ. Move beyond milk. Because spiritual maturity, it does produce fruit. And that's what he goes on to in verse 7. He starts speaking of herbs and, and weeds. Or, or you could say wheat and tares, to use Jesus' illustration. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receive blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected and near to being cursed though, whose end is to be burned. By the way, you'll stand before God one day and when you stand before God, every work that you've ever done will be weighed right there. The wheat and the tares, the good and the bad. And, and the, the works that were wood, hay, and stubble burn away. All the things that you did that had no eternal value, even if you said you were doing them in Jesus' name, they have no value. They're burned. They're waste. What will you be left with? What gold, silver, and precious jewels will you be left with? And so here, move on to spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity does produce good works. James. There's lots of references in James. So I'm just saying James is a whole there. Lots of references in James that talk about good works. And then lastly, spiritual, I'm second to lastly, spiritual maturity ministers to one another. Now we don't, this is not one of those great one another passages that literally says one another. But notice it's talking about one another. Verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward His name in that you ministered to the saints and do minister. So there it is, ministering to the saints. 
to others. Spiritual maturity means we minister to one another. We're confident. There's a spiritual maturity here of investing in other people. Why? Because verse 10, God remembers our labor of love. The spiritually mature mature, remember the character of God, that God is just. And, And when we love for Him, He gets the glory. And so they seek to love for God's sake. To, to have shown, he says, to have shown toward his name. So we can love for Jesus. And that's what he's talking about. This is the ministry to other saints, but doing it for God. And then lastly, spiritual maturity takes diligence to the end. He goes on in verse 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Diligence here is eagerness. Eager to demonstrate a life of hope. Confidently living in the power of Christ. Demonstrating that God has changed you. Paul says this in Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound or even superabound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to admonish one another. And so spiritual maturity takes hard work and faith and patience as we imitate Christ, and as we imitate others. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Be ye followers or imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. If we're mature, that's what we're called to do. Invest in one another. Disciple one another. Teach one another the things that we know of Christ. There's a certain component in this passage of progression. If you're not moving forward, then you're moving backwards. If you're not consuming meat, then you're going back to milk. If you're not growing in your faith, then you're shrinking back and becoming malnourished. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean there's not times that are up and down, times where we start to grow, times where we start to shrink back. But may those times be days, a week, certainly not months and years or decades. Discipleship necessitates passing on what we know of Christ. And so who are you passing it on to? Who are you teaching to live and love like Jesus Christ? And again, I'm not saying sitting in a classroom in the church and instructing people. A father and a mother should be discipling their child. A fellow church member should be discipling one another. There's spiritual progress being made. And it always requires a faithful love like Christ. So where are you? You're returning to baby things or pressing forward to meet. Let's give Christ the glory. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us, your love for us. And if we're honest, we have failed we have failed to grow at times like we should we are tempted to move back into the comfortable and the ease we must ask you to forgive us forgive us for only trying to eat the basics 
when you have laid before us a bountiful table of your goodness. Lord, help us as a church to invest in one another in feeding off of the meat of your word. Lord, it is to our shame that we have not grown like we should. And unfortunately, we, we know we have provided more shame for you. But I pray you would help us today to gain victory, to rest in who you are, to grow so that we can propel forward your message of truth and love, that we would love our fellow believers with the love that you have loved us and that we would share the truth of your word, we would be excited to share the things that we have learned of you. And so we thank you for your goodness. We repent of our failure, but we plead with you for your mercy. Help us to grow and become more like you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to change entirely how we finish tonight.